What's up, everybody? Welcome to The Stack. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And on The Stack, we talk about a bunch of comic books that have come Damn out right. this week. we got yeah, a lot to can. go through, so let's kick it off with The Invincible Iron Man, number one, from Marvel, written by Jerry Dugan, art by Juan Dukes. for Gary. In this issue, we're getting yet another mission statement on Iron Man. He doesn't have the same fortune he once did. And he is screwing up all over the place with a new villain targeting him. This is yet another Iron Man number one, yet another take on Iron Man. But how are you feeling about this? Do you feel like this is bold? Do you feel like this is new? Are you on board with where the Dukes is taking you? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd get in a, an unmarked van with the Dukes any day, and that's what this feels like. Is um, we're going into some s- slightly different places with Iron Man. Like he's a little bit more of a fuck up. Um, it seems like he's uh, not on top of things, and I find that um, a little bit refreshing. I have a little bit of um, uh, fatigue when it comes to um, our comic book characters being so good at everything. So I like that we're seeing some uh, mistakes that this Iron Man's making. And the mystery seems interesting to me that is introduced here. Feels like we're getting some maybe Armor Wars adjacent uh, type of story here, but with a darker edge to it. Yeah, I mean, the Dukes has done some amazing stuff. So I'm going to go... The Dukes is done. uh, I'm going to go with him on this ride because I want to see his take on Iron Man. You know what I mean? So... Uh, yeah, we've we've seen this before, but I'm very interested to see kind of how this all pans out. There's some interesting tweaks here that we're making. So, uh, yeah, I'm intrigued. Uh, it's got some great art and some interesting kind of setup here, and I'm uh, interested to see how it all kind of pans out. This to me feels like a very post Robert Downey Jr. Iron Man, which I appreciated mm. ever mm. since he was introduced in the movies. And I think rightly so, going back to the Matt Fraction run, everybody has been very much hitting the tone of how Downey Jr. did the character, right? In the comics, yeah. they've been following up on that. This feels like an extension, an elaboration on that without. It, feel, it feels like a comic, not a movie, which feels like a dumb thing to say about a comic, but it, does feel dumb. it is appreciated <laughs> in terms of we are reading comics and they don't just have to be ancillary to the MCU. So I like that quite a bit. I enjoyed the story. I definitely harumphed my arms a little bit and went, Ooh. okay, another number one. What are we going to do here? But mm. by the end, uh, I was on board with the story. I liked it. It's like you said, Justin, it's an interesting mystery. And Juan Fergari's art, it's some good, solid superhero art that matches the tone of the story very well. So, Agreed. Good stuff. Yeah. Next up, I know this is one of Pete's most anticipated issues of the past several decades, I believe. Batman Spawn, number one, from DC Comics, written by Todd McFarlane, art by Greg Capullo. In this issue, and you're going to be pretty shocked here, Batman and Spawn end up in the same universe. They fight, and then maybe team up? Uh, no, yeah. dude, no. First off... Okay, you're right. Yeah. Okay, that's totally how it happens. <laughs> but uh, the team up is glorious, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the art is super tight bananas here. This is just uh, uh, such a cool, well executed uh, crossover kind of setup. I was just kind of blown away by this. I felt like, you know, okay, we've seen these types of kind of like uh, uh, team up or kind of crossover things, but. I was really, really uh, uh, kind of blown away by the attention to detail. I mean, you got callbacks to Zack Snyder's uh, No Face Joker here that was bananas. Scott Snyder. Scott, Scott Snyder. Snyder. Not Zack Snyder. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, he's yeah, Zack yeah, Snyder. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, uh, yeah. Rob he's, Snyder. He's, I met the pretzel. Uh, Rob, no, I Rob, just Snyder's, feel- Rob Snyder. Rob Schneider's uh, Batman. Oh, uh, no, go in the wrong direction. It's okay, Pete. You know we're always going to edit that out and then put it in every episode going forward <laughs> here on out on the stack. Uh, great. Um, you know Zack Snyder's been thinking of a faceless Joker as well. So it's, uh, that's... Let me ask comment. you guys a question, because not to yuck Pete's yum or anything like that, but... Uh, Greg Capullo, first of all, perfect artist for this. this Love. Is Espe- perfect. Especially Batman and Spawn. Come, Come on. on. If, uh, who else are you going to get than Greg Capullo? Like, there's literally nobody yeah. else you're going to get. So I mean, that's could, great. I mean, there's and a lot of artists. And he drew amazing. the No Face Joker in the first place on, yeah. I believe it was Zack Snyder's run 
Batman, or maybe it's yeah. I don't know. Whatever. Uh, Zach gonna, Morris. Don't be Zach dick. Morris is okay, yes. Batman on Scott Snyder's run. I in this issue, and this is, I guess, a spoiler here. But Joker's like, "Hey, want to see me without my face?" <laughs> and oh, takes off his face oh, oh. and shows it. I never needed to see that, and not on like a gross level, but like Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo when they were doing it always played it as like. It's Less more horrific more. if you're imagining it. And Todd yes. McFarlane, in classic Todd McFarlane fashion, is like, hey, want to see his fucking face? Hey, you want to fucking see his face, Hey, you want right? to see it? It's gross. Yeah. It's yeah. so gross. So I was a little put off by that. Oh, well, interesting. I mean, I think that that sort of is a nice way of encapsulating the story of this book in general, where it's very much like, oh, yeah, um, Martha Wayne died. Remember those pearls? We're going to see nine pearls in nine different ways, and the pearls are going to have souls in them. And did you ever think about that? Um, is a big part of it. And then Batman, to your point earlier, is like they spawn and Batman fight, and then they team up. And Batman is spending, like, multiple times, he's like, why don't we talk and then team up? And then a couple of panels later, he's like, let's just chat about this. It's not a big deal. We could team up. And then they chat, go out on, and it feels like oh, we know this st- story. So let's either move through it fast or find a new way of getting to it. I will say, I like the Court of Owls as the villains here. Yeah. Sort of touching on, there's some interesting connections between the Batman and Spawn backstory that are made here. And that to me is more fun, almost like a layering of the characters upon each other to show the connection points. I, I hope they get further into that um, as it goes forward, because that feels like sort of new storytelling uh, material. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is not laughing at what you were saying. In the book, there's this whole plot line where it's like to get back to the Zack Snyder at all. It's very clearly riffing off the like, Martha, why did you say that name moment? And instead they have the moment where Spawn is like, my wife died on that day. And he's like, wait, what was her name? And she, he's like, Wanda. And he's like, all right, that's, that's a different name than my mom's name. They have different yeah. names. And it's. Well, it's his mom and his wife, right? It's yeah, different. I know. They're also different people and whatever. Well, I mean, they're talking just... about the parallels of the two characters. Sure. Well, why don't I talk a little bit since I'm the only one who liked this fucking comic, apparently. <laughs> uh, I, I like That's the comparison. That's never stopped you in the past. <laughs> I, I like the My comparison guy. of these two. I've never kind of thought about them as similar before. So I like the idea of a, approaching it that way. I also like the two of them standing in their alleys that they feel very comfortable and being like, hey, no, 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 you come over here no no i don't want to come over to your side you come over to my side uh yeah. but um this kind of thing that the uh, court of isles have been kind of like uh, uh pulling strings on these guys for a long time is kind of a crazy reveal also the fact that you know batman decided against talking at first like went fisticuffs uh uh when maybe he shouldn't was such a crazy kind of choice that i was surprised about i'm i'm rarely kind of like you know being like oh my god batman calm down uh but i i feel like this was uh interesting the kind of like set up to bring these two characters together and it wasn't their choice you know they were kind of being manipulated but also the fact that like Yes, there's way too many stuff with the pearls, but this uh, new idea that the pearls maybe mean something different that that uh, Batman's uh, father knew about ahead of time and was trying to hide from people is very interesting. Um, but uh, I'm just such a, a sucker for this art and for this team up that I was just already on board from go and I just couldn't believe you know how spectacular the art is how interesting the story is going to be and how epic it feels i don't want to yuck your yum uh i will say that (laughs) i did really like joker with a bunch of baby violators oh my god that was that was cool yeah that was very fun a vicious circle number one from boob studios written by mattson tomlin art by lee bermejo i'm just going to say up front this is my issue of the week i was completely blown away by this one this is i almost hesitate to say anything about this because knowing what it is going in is a bit of a spoiler (laughs) but the big thing that i throw out there is lee bermejo pushes himself in terms of the art in a way that i've never seen before in terms of a million different styles and techniques and different ways of hitting it there's horror in here there's time travel there's family drama going on this feels like 
and I say this complimentarily, but this feels like a brilliant little movie pitch, but in comic book form, but not in the way where it's like, yeah, 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 we're doing the comics so we can get to the movie. Instead, from a story perspective, there's a clear hook right off. It's propulsive from the very beginning in terms of the action and the emotion. And Lieber Mayo's art, again, like... It's unbelievable. Th- th- there were pages where I was like, how is he doing this? Yes. I know. It's I insane. don't know how. I mean, it's one of those things where, like, super tight bananas art doesn't do it justice. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, first off, mm. the reveal, like, you, you get things that are, like, black and white in the beginning, and you, you don't realize till later why that is. It, I love black and white art, and it's so beautifully detailed, just so well done. Uh, each panel, like, I've read this three times through just because i love the feeling of it like the the emotions that you get from the panels the just flipping through and seeing uh the storytelling through the art to see the perspective through the art to see the small little details around the eyes and the crying it's just it's very moving it is very well done this is an unbelievable comic and you need to get on board with this first ish because it is bananas good it is so so moving so well done it's gonna grab you and you don't want them to let go wow that rarely happens in my personal life um p are you in the pocket of big banana like has has the Chiquita banana <laughs> woman approached you in a way that is speaking of laying hands upon you? Are you in trouble? Is what I'm asking you in a banana sense? <laughs> Are you in banana I'm aware trouble? of. Uh, um, it Just sounds checking. like it sounds like a good kind of trouble to be in as banana trouble, but no, I'm uh, I'm I'm not in uh, big banana or whatever. I just think it's that- like. You know, the art is just unbelievable. You it's know really good. I mean? It's like, you know, when you hear those stories where it's like someone got a, like a metal bar lodged in their head and they suddenly like know Spanish. I feel like something <laughs> happened in your brain where you only speak banana now. Well, just and, saying, you know, the art's unbelievable. The art's superb. It's sublime. It's moving. You know, I just, I feel like uh, type bananas is a weird way to grab yeah. somebody's attention to be like, you True. really have to check this out. That's great. That's true. And I love that rationale. And I don't know that we've ever talked about this. There's a lot of minions who listen to our podcast. So they Mm -hmm. very much, they've been writing in. I get all of these emails all day that just say subject line, da, na, na. And then it's, but na, 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 over and over again. They're having a great time. Yeah. The fans, the minions love Pete. Uh, but back on this book, um, you guys have said a lot, and I agree this book is amazing. The art is incredibly detailed, and then they're not afraid to sort of discard what's come to move into something else. It reminded me a little bit of, I'll make some light comparisons that uh, uh, aren't super spoiler, I don't think, but um, Blade Runner, Quantum mm-hmm. Leap, um, like taking sort of uh, a, a, a classic battle, uh, like a head-to-head story um and really pushing it into a, a place i never expected it was very cool so good do not miss this one next yeah. up another one that you do shouldn't miss. miss art brute number one from image comics written by w maxwell prince art by martin marazzo we had both of them on the show this week we should yes, talk to them about it we talked to them about it this is a book about some crazy stuff that's going on in the art world. Specifically, somebody has changed the Mona Lisa. So she has started winking. Other things and other pieces of art are winking as well. The only person who can handle it is Arthur Brute, a seemingly crazy man who has the power to enter paintings, or does he? That's what we find out over the course of this book. If you are used to Ice Cream Man, this is a very different mode for this team. What do you think about this one? I mean, this is really top tier comics making. This is really unbelievable in such a creative, cool way. There's a moment here where, you know, spoilers, but they jump into the art. And I kind of feel like those characters, because the art pulls you into this kind of insane, tripped out world. I was just so impressed with this book. It is, there's action, there's just like a dash of spookiness is just so cool, so different from a lot of different characters. Uh, I was just so, so impressed by this comic and uh, cool name. 
<laughs> um, I also really enjoyed this. I talked about this in the live show that it feels oh, did like you? I did. Uh, feels like um, a Jason Bourne type story set in a world where um, a new uh, world. art is the uh, palette in which um, these large crimes and sort of fantastical superpowers exist. Um, Alex had a good comparison to Doom Patrol. I thought about. Dipping in an R and not afraid to, um, I, I just wanted it to be here too. I'm not afraid to um, push at the edges of the world. Um, and it, I mean, we're huge Ice Cream Man fans, as you may hear um, later on in this very podcast. So this takes that sensibility and applies it in a little bit more of an action, wide premise blockbuster um, place. Danger Street, number one from DC Comics, written by Tom King, art by Jorge Fornis. This is a huge widespread look at some of the forgotten corners of the dc universe as we get i'm not even going to attempt to list all of the characters that show up here but we get anybody from the creeper to metamorpho on various paths as they all start to collide thanks to the hope of three heroes including mikhail starman uh justin you had to be pretty excited about love that. metamorpho that and another guy that I honestly don't remember the name of, who are trying to summon Darkseid to take him down in order to get entry into the Justice League in predictable Tom King fashion. It goes horribly wrong, and we get a very dark take on these classic happy characters. I know we've been split about Tom King stuff in the past, but how are we feeling about this one? One issue in. Uh, I, I love guess this. I'll... Okay. You go, you go, you go, you it go. It seemed go. like he was teeing you up. That's why I was letting you go. But that's okay. That's why I started talking, but uh, you go too. Well, I only started causing because there was a pause and you were looking at your phone, so I thought maybe you wanted me to go. <clears throat> no, I never want you to go. Okay. Um, so what I... <laughs> Just kidding, Pete. Um, <clears throat> this, is, um, this is sort of a weirder flavor from Tom King. The writing style is a little bit different. Um, and it, the characters, it's, uh, he, there's a lot of mystery. A lot of his books have sort of like a little bit of coyness to them about what's actually happening. This one feels even more so. And the fact that it's a larger ensemble than we usually deal with, with him is curious, um, to me. Um, there's, there's clearly an inciting incident in this book, but I love the character choices. I love the Dr. Fate helmet as sort of the, um, mm -hmm. object of power that everyone's rallying around mm -hmm. and, uh, Mikhail Thomas, uh, uh, Star Michael Tomas Starman here is really exciting, um, just as a character that I haven't seen in a bit. Um, he still it takes the same thing that Tom King does, where it takes a character and gets to an essence, and then uses that to tell an interesting story on a wider scale. It feels like he's boiling down a lot of different characters' essences. Like Metamorpho is sort of a goofy dope, it seems <laughs> like, and that's really fun. Yeah, uh, for me, this is kind of a sad book. Um, it's a really fun cast. And of course, with Tom King, you're going to get some j crazy jumping around in the timeline of the story. Uh, but unbelievable art. I I was mixed on this one as well. I think that's what I'm getting from you guys. I think Jorge Fornes and Tom King work as a phenomenal team together. They clearly know each other very well and work together very well. So we're getting a lot of like Watchmen nine panel style yeah, layout yeah. grids going on here. This is clearly the team working in the world of Jack Kirby and playing around in that the same way that Tom King has been kind of playing in like the Justice League International era with over in Human Target and honestly a couple of other places. So this is a specific time in the DC universe that he's embracing those characters for. It, it like you said, Justin, I'm not quite sure what the story is yet, other than the inciting incident. I think we're gonna have a better idea of it with the second issue. So this isn't quite the clear pitch across the plate that we usually get with his books. It reminded me a little more of Heroes in Crisis in terms mm. of this is taking a while to kind of like figure out what it is. So I'm always on board with the Tom King book. I'm excited to see it. Love Jorge Fornes. Curious to see where this goes. 
Next up, Monica Rambeau, Photon number one for Marvel, written by Eve L. Ewing, art by Luca Maresca with Eva Ivan Fiorella. This is following Monica Rambeau as she recenters herself as a hero in the Marvel Universe, kind of trying to figure out what her place is now that she's no longer Captain Marvel and gone through some pretty hard times. There's a lot of recap of this issue, a lot of guest stars, but what did you think about this kickoff? Yeah, I agree. I felt like there was a lot of like uh, uh, cameos and stuff like that that kind of pulled away. I wanted some more like alone time with Rambo here to kind of really get Rambo. Yeah, yeah, I wanted some uh, Ram Shambo time here where we're just kind of like spending time in her head, getting to know a little bit about what her. I mean, I do agree with her immensely that there's nothing like a bodega egg ham and cheese you know what yeah I mean? I mean she prefers bacon hey, hey, well, it's you know, bacon egg and ham guy. Guy. get the ham out of here get the ham out of here no, no, no one's no, doing no, ham no, no. It's get, uh, get, no, 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 see you know you you've been le- you left new york a while ago and this ham shit take it home taylor hey. ham is that what you're talking about get the fuck out of here hey dude i'm just saying you know it comes with bacon egg and cheese instead of bacon if you want don't get me wrong. I love bacon, but yeah, you, you can know, do anything you want. You could eat the dirt on the ground if you wanted to, but when you go to a bodega, you're getting a bacon, egg, and cheese, and you're getting the fuck out of there. Talking to your guy, they, they you're dropping you, your they, money, you're getting a coffee cup. You're not being snobby about your coffee. You're getting your classic coffee cup, black, out of there. That's a breakfast in New York City, my man. And Pete, you don't know shit about New York. <laughs> <laughs> That's bullshit, dude. I put in fucking 20 years, bro. 21 years, actually, or maybe it's 22. You left. You got out because you couldn't handle it. You couldn't handle well, it. Well, uh, there was a huge culture. pandemic. Uh, so it kind of, I'm not uh, familiar. I haven't heard about that. So yeah, it was kind of a, it was kind of a big deal. Look into it. Uh, anyways, to get back to this book. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I really thought it had, uh, uh, fantastic art. They did a good job of setting things up. So, you know, I'm excited to see what else happens with the Rambo. Um, so, uh, we'll see, but, uh, yeah, yeah. I wanted, I wanted a little more alone time. Alone yeah. time with Monica. All the time. You know what I mean? Fair enough. Assassin's Apprentice, number one, from Dark Horse Comics, written by Robin Hood. Hmm. Uh, Robin Hobb, excuse me. And wow. <laughs> I, you. Uh, art by Ryan Kelly. In this issue, we're meeting a bunch of medieval characters. What'd you think about it? And doggies. <laughs> oh, and doggies. Oh, don't forget about the dogs. Yes. I mean... You know, I, I wasn't sure if, like, the kid had, like, dog powers or could just commune and talk to dogs or control dogs. But there was definitely some serious dog vibes going on. Um, yeah. But, yeah, uh, beautiful art, uh, absolutely gorgeous, and then kind of brings you back to an old-timey times here. Um, and uh, I, what I really liked was this kind of setup it's a very solid setup for more you know you have this kid you don't know who his parents are or what's going on with him uh and uh so i feel like it's going to be an interesting kind of story that unfolds uh but you don't get too much you just kind of get a little bit of like him sleeping with dogs and uh having dog powers not sexually not sexually i just want to be clear yeah Pete yeah, was not clear he's sleeping with dogs like actually just literally sleeping with them he's not that yeah, there's no room at the end. He has to sleep with the dogs. And it's not that kind of, I would have made a caveat or kind of freaked out about it if that was the case. I w- I'm not 100%. cool with the bestiality. I don't know why you would think that. Nice. What a big stance to take at this um, date and time, Pete. Thank, Thank you, you for for being so brave. Um, uh, this book, it felt very um, sort of Game of Thrones, like a kinder, gentler Game of Thrones oh, situation saying, with yeah. some, uh, that, get yeah. hop into a puppy's mind briefly. It's like taking some of the larger Game of Thrones world uh, look, um, some character types, and just being like, they talk to beat. No, they just talk to puppies. They, this uh, Everyone's sort of nice in a different way. Um, this felt to me a little bit like reading something that was a licensed property, and I'm not sure what it was. The yes, entire time, yes, yes, I yes, kept yes. thinking, is this an Assassin's Creed thing that I don't know about that wasn't established right. in the beginning? So there's some sort of context that's missing there. And like Pete was saying, there's not enough of a story over the course of the first issue to really hook into anything. But it's still well written. It's well drawn. I'm just not sure what's going on at this point. That's all. Okay. 
Two Graves, number two from Image Comics, written by Jean Viev Valentine, art by Annie Wu. This is following up on the first issue where our character is traveling along with what seems like, but may or may not be, the specter of death, visiting various people as they are about to die or about to be killed. We're still purposely not totally clear on what's going on, but there's some big changes and twists in the mythology here. I liked the first issue quite a bit of this, and I loved the second issue. I'm very much on board with this book now. I think this is really interesting and ultimately potentially could head towards some very powerfully emotional spaces by the end. Pete, take it away. Yeah, um, I was really blown away by this issue. Uh, this is like toy bananas art. I mean, super toy. toy. Uh, bananas art. I Toy. mean, it is really impressive what they're doing here. The character designs are so cool. The persons who you can't see their face, but they have a face, but it looks like maybe there's like a plastic bag over their face, but it's so artistic and cool looking that it's not a plastic bag. I, I just unbelievable. Yeah. Just really very, very cool. Love the storyline. Love everything that's unfolding that we get to witness. Just, oh, I'm having a blast with this book. It is so fucking impressive. You got to check it out, man. <laughs> um, I also like this a lot. It's a, a deepening mystery. Um, and I think it's rare in a, a new comic series to have a mystery that deepens in a way where I don't feel like I don't know enough information or I know too much information where it just feels like a premise dropped in my lap. It feels like we're sort of stepping into this darker place um, where there is going to be some more fantastical elements. It's not just as simple. I'm riding with um, death. Um, and, and I really like Pete was saying, I love the art choice of this sort of blurry plastic baggy face over our quote unquote monster here. And I think we are going to find out that that monster is perhaps not death. Um, itself, but per, but maybe linked uh, to our main character. I think that's fair to say. Let's talk about Dark Crisis Big Bang number one from DC Comics, written by Mark Wade, art by Dan Jurgens and Norm Rapland. This is ostensibly, I believe, taking place after Dark Crisis, with the Flash deciding, hey, the Anti Monitor is missing. Why don't we track him down and beat the shit out of him throughout the multiverse? What do you guys think? Yeah. And that's kind of what this issue is, but also on a more logistical level, it's about resetting what the DC Comics multiverse looks like now, including a list in the back of a bunch of different universes. This is fun. I had a fun time. I feel like this is, yeah, like a really kind of classic DC fun here. You get all the different Earths and different heroes, and it's a fun mashup, and there's a lot of action uh yeah I, I really feel like the art ma matches the idea really well it just kind of feels like just kind of really cool classic dc fun here it's a great silver age hang it's like yeah. sitting down with an older uh person and hearing them tell stories um it feels like you know what i'm talking about, about that? i mean i feel like you it's a little that? bit better than that you know what i mean i'm not saying it's bad i'm not saying it, there's no negative well, it feels like I mean, sometimes when you sit with an old person they kind of rattle on a lot and then you got to reel them back you're in. hanging out with the wrong old people pete oh okay um because what i'm saying is it, it had that sort of like uh like sepia tone to it it felt like a comic uh story out of a different time and again i'm not being at all negative when i say that it was pretty straightforward um some fun stuff with the flash like winding up like a wrecking ball and flying through uh, uh taking his mass using a little um einstein uh relativity here to take his mass toward infinity to wreck some shit so yeah, it was uh, cool ideas, but in general, it felt very Silver Age, very bright, smiling heroes um, doing a big thing together. The Amazing Spider-Man number 15 from Marvel, written by Zeb Wells, art by Ed McGuinness. This is continuing the Dark Web storyline as Ben Riley, a.k.a. Chasm, and Madeline Pryor, a.k.a. the Goblin Queen, are taking it to the Marvel Universe, bringing Inferno back to the X-Men and Spider-Man here. Venom, who is back to classic Venom, is attacking Spider-Man. And I'll tell you what, this is how I prefer Venom. I wish Venom yeah. had never changed from a crazy, roided out dude who is just trying to eat Spider-Man's brains. <laughs> it, it, is, it is funny that this issue is sort of making fun of 
Venom, I think, yeah. for a lot of it. Making fun of old Venom, but also sort of making fun of new Venom by being like, isn't this what we want Venom to be like in general? Like licking stuff all the time, very tongue forward Venom. Um, but I also want to give like this crossover feels sort of wonky. It feels very different. In an age where we've had a lot of crossovers that feel like, ah, I see what's happening here. They're going to go do this. They're going to do this. There's a side issue here. Excuse me. This one feels like it's like, hey, we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, we're bringing in X-Men and Spider-Man characters, and they are um, dealing with a fully demonic New York City, where, but in a funny way, like where books are flying around for, for birds, things like that. So it feels like a lot of creativity. Uh, there's a creativity engine in this story that will take us into some interesting places. And again, I've been really liking the current Spider-Man take because there's a little bit of mystery. We don't know how he fucked up in the past, but it's got him off his game. And that's when Spider-Man is sort of in his best um, place. Uh, yeah, I, I disagree a little bit with the uh, JT Sizz here. Uh, this to me was a lot of fun. I feel like, uh, you that's know, it's fun. Well, I, yeah, but you also had some negative Nancy stuff to say about it. I felt like this was a, a very enjoyable Spider-Man issue if I haven't had in a while. So I just like the fact that like they stayed away from some danger zones. At one point, the character was Your like, yeah, don't zones. bring up my name. Don't even talk about it. There's no need to get into that kind of stuff. And I appreciate it. Like, let's just stay with like what they were doing. They're like, here's a dumb Venom. Let's have some fun with that. This is, you know, and I felt like it was very action forward, very kind of like Spider-Man quippy in a good amount. I felt like this was a very uh, successful issue as a Spider-Man comic. I really appreciated what they did and how they kind of managed the little time that they had. Uh, I thought it was a blast and uh, I was very grateful for it. And I'll throw out, sorry, just real quick on the continuity bent. I think there's a pretty, I, I appreciate that they've been doing this almost every issue. They keep dropping little breadcrumbs in terms of what happened with Spider-Man and what went wrong. There's a pretty big one here that seems to imply that maybe Mary Jane died or something terrible happened to her and only Norman Osborn could save her. So that explains a lot of the status quo, if that's what's happening. That's and I, exactly what happened. Well, but we don't know what happened. So I love the fact that, like, they just kind of dropped that in here as Spider-Man saying that and kind of moved on, not hoping you don't notice, but just sort of being like, oh, either you notice or you don't in the middle of this wild Venom story. So yeah, good stuff. Billionaire Island Cult of Dogs, number two from Ahoy Comics, written by Mark Russell, art by Steve Pugh. In this issue, we're following this world where all billionaires well most billionaires have died in a island disaster in the first series everybody is coming after a money dog is that what it is business dog business, business dog, business dog. Business dog dude me. come on business dog who is the richest living thing on the planet a bunch of armies are coming after him and some other folks are as well there's a fair amount of merciless scurrying of various fringe celebrities who now suck pretty hard including kevin sorbo and gina kevin carano. sorbo get some heat on this yeah kevin sorbo gina carano and kevin spacey and one other who i couldn't figure out who that was but what'd you guys think about this issue i thought it was uh it was fun like it poked some fingers and i was like yeah i feel like uh business dog is hilarious and uh uh kind of a fun commentary uh, yeah, I thought it was creative and different and uh, had some great art. Uh, I really love the ending. Uh, kind of like they did a great job of starting us in a place and then kind of bringing it back full circle to that moment. So I really appreciated that. Uh, yeah, I was impressed. Um, I also, I mean, I love Mark Russell's just sort of uh, take on things and his ability to, to bring in politics while not sort of losing the whole story to political commentary. And this is fun. I like going after the actors that he goes after who are pretty um, irresponsible human beings uh, in my uh, take. Um, and the, the business dog thing is is really funny. Um, the, the, a dog-based economy is what the world is dealing with, which uh, would be hard to really work in, I, I feel. Yeah, I feel like we're close, man. We're getting yeah. there, man. We're getting there. Spud McKenzie. 
Radiant Black, number 20. Real quick, real quick. I don't know if I've talked about this in the show, but uh, Spuds McKenzie, as we all know, is um, famed uh, Budweiser R. dog R. mask. R.I.P. Mm-hmm. Spuds. Do you guys think it's strange that he wasn't called Suds McKenzie? Because hmm. of beer? Yeah, but beer is made from potatoes. Nope. No, no, nope. it's not. Sure. It's it's famously vodka. not. Vodka. A certain okay. vodka is. Yeah. I'm not vodka familiar with penis. this vodka you keep talking about. But... Budweiser's made from vodka. rice. Um, so even that's not potato. No. Huh. Yeah. Um, potato, rice is made from, it's not small potatoes. They're the same shape. I'm sure they, they did similar a shapes. lot of different, uh, you know, I'm sure they had meetings. I'm sure they did. Uh, you know, certain panels where they checked with people and, you know, Spuds probably got better numbers than Suds. But I hear what you're saying. Don't you think Suds would just make a lot? Like, but I feel Spuds like it's almost that type. Spuds is fun, of... bro. You know what I mean? It's a funner the name dog? than Suds. Yeah. Why? Suds are what you're after. Spuds? Uh, I've never heard of a lot of Spuds. Another well, listen, spud. if there's a dog named Suds, I don't know if I'm going to trust him. But a dog named Spuds, I'm in. You hey, trusted Pete, Doug. Did you guys, did you hear that Justin got a time machine? I talked to him about it. It turns out he's not going to kill baby Hitler and he's no. not going to stop the Kennedy assassination, but do a third thing, which is go back in time and change the name of Spuds. I haven't said I haven't committed to it. I will I will say I've set the date of when Spuds McKenzie was created on the time machine, but I haven't pressed go yet. Yeah. But you'll maybe, when we come back here. Maybe tell him and, don't and drink so much. And to be clear, he is longer. not going to have sex with that dog. That is not a thing that he's going to do. Yeah, exactly. That didn't I'm come glad, up in any way. Better. Right, Pete, just to be clear, that's not something you have Yeah, to I know you were wondering of, about that. but Yeah, no, Pete, because of was. your stance, your anti-bestiality stance that you, again, very bravely took earlier in the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Radiant Black, number 20 from Image Comics. Yes, written by Kyle Radiant Higgins, Black. Art by Marcella Costa. And this issue... The duo of Radiant Black, as well as a bunch of other Radiants, are taking on a giant robot that is menacing the world. After a couple of wild, different issues, we're getting one of the most straightforward superhero issues of the title in a while here. Pete, I know you really dug this one. Why is that? Okay, first off, it's hilarious. All right, there's really a lot of great lines in here. The I Love Corn line is hilarious. There's a lot of fun moments uh, but also the art is uh, fantastic. But there have been all these kind of radiant kind of uh, uh, different uh, universes we've gone down and different. We just did the the pink one. So like the fact that it all kind of really uh, culminated into this issue was uh, fantastic. I was really impressed the way it all came together and the the, the whole kind of un- unraveling of the team and all this stuff and and also the reveal of maybe the yellow radiant who's kind of uh the all seeing uh, was such a cool tease i'm i'm into it i'm having a blast and uh i feel like this was such a great uh accumulation of all these kind of uh, uh different arcs that we've been on i felt like it all kind of came together in such a cool issue that was just so action forward and so badass uh, also, the art uh, continues to be super tight bananas. Mm, yes, super tight bananas. Um, the uh, I wanted to say about Radiant Black, I feel like we've talked about how we love the universe, the different characters, the storytelling. But I feel like maybe the big thing that is really working for this book and the whole universe is just the pacing. The way that all these stories are really paced out and very meticulously designed to include other characters from the Radiant Black universe, while at the same time pushing the larger mystery down the line, while also having a lot of time for the characters to sort of fuck around and be themselves in different issues. Um, So that to me is maybe because I think there's something to really examine with Radiant Black's wild success as a universe it's so hard to launch one character in a comic let alone a whole sort of line of characters that are all in the same story and they've been so successful in the radiant black uh, universe and i'd love to crack why today i'm going to say it's pacing i i think that's fair the thing that i thought you were going to say was art just because they have phenomenal artists working on this damn line right as well marcella costa we've talked about this a million times but does a great job of channeling classic invincible at every issue and yeah. every issue i'm struck by that anew 
like Pete was talking about, very fun issue, very enjoyable. Let's move on to probably an easy one to talk about. Harley Quinn Uncovered, number one from DC Comics. This is a collection of covers of Harley Quinn comics, but there are some additions in classic Harley Quinn fashion, written by Dave Wilgos, art by Riley Rosmo, some interstitial pages, and some commentary on the covers themselves. It was fun. If you like Harley Quinn, I, I think it's a fun thing to pick up, and it's a nice tribute to the cover artists. Yeah, if you like, yeah, I, I mean, mean, there's not a, just to be clear, there's not a real story going on here. Um, this small, is not a little, very tiny. If this isn't pushing Harley into a certain, excuse me, different place or time or anything. Um, but I mean, there are a lot of great covers. I really liked later on, we get some of the Batman um, esque covers that um sort of they inserted harley into uh they um yeah there's this classic artist. Uh, covers that they kind of in, uh, put her on and, and kind of made it fun i yeah it's a it's an impressive collection of co- covers for sure uh yeah if you want pinups this is what you should check out it's some, some amazing stuff uh you know it rosmo does uh um, is amazing artist um there's only like three or four pages of it in here though uh so i don't know if that's worth it but it it is great um yeah this is just a collection so just of to covers. check pete you're saying it's not worth it for the art alone no well because the cover art Boom. is great it's just the rosmo cosmo style that you want to kind of get in your comic you're only going to get like three pages of it so i don't know if that's uh, worth it but um yeah uh, the the covers are a really impressive collection what'd you think of the page where um um Harley talks about um, be turning 30 and saying it all starts falling apart at 30. Do you feel I, like that's true? I feel like I mean, I, the, I'm the I youngest disagree. member of the I'm the youngest <laughs> member of comic book club, but I want to hear what you guys thought about that. Sure. And just to be clear, you're 18 and we're both 19. So yeah. I don't really know. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I would, <laughs> what is that voice you just did? I would disagree. Perhaps, I don't uh, think it all falls apart at 30. I think it's later that it really starts to fall. When? I mean, uh, 40 probably. Mm, nice. Yeah. Great. Something to look forward to. For some. <laughs> wow. All right. For specs, some people. Specs you're number two. is you you're well into your 40s bro so don't well, i wouldn't say i'm well into my 40s <laughs> i would sir. say so i would, I would say, say so. you're well into your 40s i wouldn't disagree great you're well into your 50s pete or is it oh 60s? fuck off dick okay. specs number two they say watching ted lasso takes years off <laughs> so i fear for you sir you could drop dead at any moment Specs number two for Boom Studios, Perfect. written by David M. Boer, art by Chris Sheehan. This is about two kids who order some specs out of the back of a comic book, and the specs grab them wishes, but very limited wishes at the end of last issue. They wish their bully away, and now they're dealing with the ramifications of that. Um, what do you think about this issue, Pete? Well, I think it's one of those things where, and I'm glad you went to me with somebody who has specs. You know what I mean? I mean, probably Justin shouldn't be able to even comment on. Yeah, I don't want you guys even. T- I don't even understand this. So they're like little um, windows you put in front of your eyes. Yeah, <laughs> I think this is very creative and very cool. Uh, I really liked. Uh, I didn't like the choice that was made at the end of the issue. I was uh, a little kind of. Um, disappointed with what happened at the end of the issue. I think, but, the, I think the characters were as well. Well, yeah, but I, I was going to say before I was cut off, I'm meant to feel that way. Yes. Um, so uh, they're doing it and I'm just kind of like, ah, oh, I wish we weren't. But overall, I'm creatively impressed with this issue, uh, with what's going on. And I'm going to still uh, tune in because um, it is uh, it is very cool what they're doing and very kind of old school fun with the old ordering stuff in the back of a comic book. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, it takes them. It's ruining their lives currently. Um, I guess the biggest question I have is like with specs, can you like watch stuff on them or is like with you guys mm-hmm. have glasses? Can you watch little movies on the inside of your glasses? Like it's always. Little, yeah, little that's whenever I close my eyes, I can imagine right. a movie in my head. Oh, nice. Is that Great. what you mean? Wow. 
I should order one of a pair of these specs, but this I'm book cur- reminds I'm, me a little I'm bit. I'm cursed with perfect vision, so I don't no. need them. You know yeah, what you I mean? Ca- you got to let them get to a stupid perfect vision bit before you cut them off. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. The, this book well, reminds me a little bit of a James Tide in the book, but not quite as horrific. JT4. Uh, but I, I like the characters and I like how they're digging into it. I'm still not quite connecting with how the glasses do this necessarily with the wishing thing. That's the thing that's sort of holding me up a little bit. But other than that, uh, I think this is good. The art is good. I, I'm enjoying it. Uh, you guys can see like x rays and stuff, though, right? You can like see under people's skin and <laughs> stuff, right? I feel like uh, maybe one thing, we got to pay extra for that. about this book yet. I have it, but let me say real quick. What I love about this is like the concept of ordering the specs feels very um, sort of uh, light, but the the dark ramifications that come out of it feel very monkey's paw. Really like that, and the um, the way that it uh, spins out of control so quickly has been cool. Curious to see where it goes. Instead of we, a monkey's paw, it's like monkey's glasses. Which we should yeah, also here. mention the art haunting. Yeah, I'm glad we squeezed it in. Yeah, there you go. It's worth it for the art. Gospel number two from Image Comics by Will Morris. This is taking place, play, I don't know, taking place back in medieval times. We had Will Morris on the show a couple of weeks ago. We did talk yes. to him about the book, which was very exciting. We love talking to him about it, right? That's Pete? why we have guests. That's why we yes, have guests. Exactly. Talking about we the talk books. to them. We don't just ask them questions about, I don't know, having sex with dogs. Is that what you're interested in? Too? Oh, my God. <laughs> Pete. Oh, my God. <laughs> It's fine. Anyway, in this book, there it was revealed in the last issue that the devil has come to a small town. There is a girl who really wants to be a renowned adventurer and is trying to write tales about it. Not quite working out in her favor, but we have a couple of twists and progression in this issue. I know we really love the first one. How do we feel about issue two? Well, it's, uh, you know, you got to start by saying it's worth it for the art alone. I mean, this is STB to the max. It's uh, the art is gore to the gus. It's really Smart. just uh, a phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal art. And uh, yeah, I, I think that this is like a cool kind of quest with a little hint of Hellboy thrown in there. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I, I'm enjoying it. I'm also very excited to see what else happens. People will be trying to translate that last se- sentence for decades. We need a Pete Rosetta Stone to get to the bottom of what are you talking about? Um, but I do like this uh, as well. I think the art is great. I have made a comparison to Fables before, and I only think that comparison hits harder as we get to this second issue. Uh, Fables, but for Christian stuff, I <laughs> like that. It's not a uh, the devil isn't being coy here. We, maybe it will be revealed that it's not a full on devil um, down the road, but it's there's plenty of confrontation here and a lot of great uh, character moments. Wildcats number two from DC Comics, written by Matthew Rosenberg, art Bergy. by Steven Segovia. In this issue, our characters are doing a bunch of classic Wildcats thing as they Wildcat all over the place. Justin, I know you love Wildcats. Take it away. I do like Wildcats, and that's what they're doing. They're not your regular cats. They're a little wild. Pete, you know about Puff and the Fluff and stuff, other cat stuff. That's when you're blowing a cat's butthole, just in case you forgot from earlier <laughs> uh, episodes. Uh, nope. No. Nope. Oh, that's not, that's that not that. That's what I was my and takeaway when you. It's okay to blow okay a to cat's blow. butthole, but it's not okay. All of a sudden, to have sex with a dog. That's so, why. So brave. That's, so proud. That's so not brave. what we're. It's nowhere near where we are. Just try to uh, translate what you're saying. Yeah, nope. exactly. Super tight bananas blowing a cat's butthole. Got you. <laughs> Got you. Are you uh, done? Uh, uh, no, I, I, I'm talking. I'm in the middle of my review about this right. book. <laughs> Get into Pete. it already. Jeez. So please, I am into it. And this is all part of it. This is all factoring <laughs> in. Because what I love about this, I in the past have been like, I don't like when the Wildcats mix with the DC Universe. But I feel like at this point now, they're really puffing the fluff of the DC Universe. They're really <laughs> uh, like incorporating the characters and e- in the last page reveal a concept in here that I think is really working. This feels like an Avengers movie this book whoa um we were talking about how um in our first review it was like a comic that felt like a comic not like a movie this is a comic that feels like a movie in a good way um especially when like our main avengers books and our justice league books 
don't really have that same sort of fast paced sort of brash storytelling right now. They're a little bit um, like Avengers are just like wild, crazy, like freewheeling into continuity. Justice League is being very crisis-y right now. This feels like big storytelling, like the Avengers movies um, that uh, we all seem to enjoy. Yeah, I, uh, you know, if you like Wildcats, you're going to like this Wildcats book. It's uh, Wildcats in a great kind of way and form. It's a little bit more updated. It's uh, the art is fantastic. It's uh, it's really a tight package. Uh, well done. Leonid the Vampire, A Christmas for Crows from Dark Horse Comics, written by Mike Mignola, art by Rochelle Aragno and Mike Mignola. This seems to be maybe the final story of Leonid the Vampire as she comes face to face with the man or skeleton man or something like that who's mm. been tracking her. There's a little bit of a postscript that takes place that Mike Mignola draws that teases that maybe there's some more to come after this. What'd you guys think about this one? I was really impressed with this one shot, uh, especially the last three pages where there wasn't a lot of words. It was all just kind of uh, just powerful imagery, which I really appreciated. I thought the girl was kind of adorable in a fun Hellboy way. I, I, I felt like this was a really cool story, and uh, I'm glad we got this one shot. I think it's, uh, you know, if you like uh, Magnolia, you like Hellboy, you're going to love this book. Yeah, I agree. This feels like it's uh, for a slightly younger audience than the other Hellboy stuff. Um, but this a had me more thinking. Wednesday of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, trying to get a little... wow. look at this topical reference coming yeah. out of me, Mr. PLP, uh, speaking for the next generation. I just wanted to say that I, a couple months ago, wished on a uh, sort of monkey's paw type of thing where I was like, why can't we have m more Mike Mignola Hellboy Universe books? Let's have one every week. And then it happened. We've yeah. had Mike Mignola books uh, set in the Hellboy or adjacent universes every week. I'm gonna t I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna pick up the monkey's paw and wish a second time. When are we gonna get an ongoing story from Mike Mignola that pushes sort of an um, the mythology into a different direction? Getting, I feel like getting too greedy. Uh, maybe I am greedy, but I'll, you know what you know what I'm saying, Pete is that's what I want. And you know I, <laughs> I when you make when you get them when you get any sort of paw. You got to make a wish on it, mm -hmm. whether it's um, a monkey's paw, some sort of um, uh, cat puff, fluff puffed paw, <laughs> oh or anything. Make a wish on that cat. Take a break from blowing into its butthole and make a wish <laughs> on that paw. And I'm saying I want something that pushes a larger mythology in the Hellboy universe. It doesn't have to be Hellboy. It feels like that story's over. But let's get back into some more big storytelling. If somebody's listening characters. to this podcast for the first time, all the deep cut references we're making is like, Oh, okay. You can rant like a madman, but when I do, it's weird. You can <laughs> say la actual nonsense and that, and be like, that's normal. Super type bananas is a normal thing to say. And when I say it is a normal flow, thing to say, I'm a crazy person. 10,000 Black Feathers, number four from image comics written by Jeff Lemire art by Andrea Sorrentino. This is continuing the bone Orchard mythos. I was about to say the bone feather mythos. That's not what it is. Anyway, uh, it is about a uh, girl who is a woman who is friends with another woman <laughs> back in the day when they were girls. And the there girl died. And then the woman got blamed for it. And now we're kind of catching up to the two timelines here, as well as finally seemingly pushing into the main narrative of these weird feathers and other supernatural things that have been going on in the background. As usual, this is a beautiful book, and I appreciate the fact that we're finally getting to whatever the story is, but I was struck this issue by this is one that maybe, and I know Pete's going to yell at me here, might be better to read in the trade. I think that is, that's a, an apt, at, wow, that's a good good idea, Alex. I agree with you. Um, I think with a lot of Jeff Lemire and uh, Andrea Sorrentino stuff, like it works better because they're very spare in their storytelling. Um, and that's not a criticism. I think their commentary um, is, or their stories are great, um, but the way they tell them is sort of uh, art forward, spare uh, spare on the words and plot. Um, it, this also reminded me of a book that we really love from early in the year, uh, The Me You Love in the Dark. Mm -hmm. um, it's a less uh, contained version, but it does feel like it's uh, sort of a character 
in discussion with darkness um, for a uh, over the course of what we've read so far anyway. Uh, this story just keeps getting better and better. Uh, you want every issue. You don't have to wait for it to be collected. You can retain information from one issue to the next and be able to hold on to it. It's not that hard of a concept. It's just so goddamn beautiful. It's tight bananas. It is just uh, the paneling and the, the creation of the pages. It's just so well done. It's very impressive. I love how the story is moving forward. I love each issue and what they're doing with it. It's just very, very impressive comic book writing. And Jeff Lemire is on top of his game. He, he's a hell of a writer. And you I want to accidentally expand. take. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, I just wanted to expand on what Pete was saying here. You don't even have to wait for the individual issues. You find where Jeff Lemire lives. Come oh, to his house. God. You sneak into his house. You take the pages as he types them right out of his typewriter. You just yeah. take don't, them away. Don't just hide that, behind Jeff. his desk or under his desk or wherever you need to be so you don't even see him. You take those pages. You read them one by one. Leave Jeff alone, man. Let no. him do his job. He lives at four. 83 Maple Leaf Lane, Canada. Check it out. Mm, oh my god. Nice. Wow, very it's like a very racist Canadian. address, bro. <laughs> racist. Racist. Okay. Anti Canadian? I don't know. Anti Canada, maybe. Sure, that's fine. Superman, son of Cal L number 18 from DC Comics, written by Tom Taylor, art by C and Torbe at Rari Coleman. This is the final issue of Superman, son of Cal. No. But don't worry, it's coming back with a new title in a few short months, so oh, we are okay. all good. Oh, it's yes. fine. But don't um, take us on an emotional roller coaster if there's no need. It's bro. been canceled forever until <laughs> later on when it's being brought back. Oh, that was a God. short roller coaster, though. It's more of a really just yes, one down. But this is finishing up the Cal L return storyline and kicking us into the next big storyline in terms of some new powers for John Kent and new relationships with the Superman family, as well as reorienting him there in terms of his place. As usual, another great issue of this book. Yeah, I agree. It's uh, it's really impressive what they're doing in this book. It continues to be impressive. This is another great ish. I also love the Lex Luthor kid team up that we get here. You know, we got Superman and his son, and it seems like Super, uh, Lex Luthor is trying to get a, a kid on his side for a showdown. And uh, I think it's very cool and uh, makes a lot of sense why Lex will be into this team up. So uh, I'm on board. I like what they're building towards. This has been uh, and continues to be an impressive comic book. Um, yeah, I agree. And I like that. In this issue, we get um, our uh, son of Kal-El, Superman, um, a real arch enemy, it seems like, and a, one with a great power sin, very threatening um, to um, all uh, Kryptonians. So that's cool. And Lex Luthor sort of assembling this team to take down uh, everybody, uh, all the Superman, uh, Supermen, um, is really cool. I like that sort of slow building tension throughout. Very happy that we're getting more of this. And just a little, just a little break. Just a little few short months. Shirtless Bear Fighter 2, number five from Image Comics, written by Jody LaHup, art by Neil Vendrell. I want to be honest with something up front here. When I was putting together the stack, when I got to Shirtless Bear Fighter, I was like, what more at this point? What different things are we going to say about Shirtless Bear Fighter? Why do we need to put this in the stack? And then I thought about it for a second. I was like, this book gives me such joy every yeah. time yeah. I read it. Let's just throw it in there and talk about it being a joyful, ridiculous, pun-filled experience. The main thing that I was struck with here uh, in this issue, we're dealing with a world that has been taken over by bear. Shirtless bear fighter is missing. Shirtless, pantless bear fighter, Jesus. bear fighter is on the loose uh, and working for Ursa Major. It's all ridiculous. This to me feels like the perfect mix of superhero comics and Mad Magazine in its prime. Oh, and nice. I yeah. I think that's what I'm enjoying about it. Pete, I know you're pretty high on this one. Take it away. 
All right. Well, yeah, this is hysterical. There's a lot of fun over the top. And what's impressive about this shirtless bear fighter is they're, they're keep raising the stakes and they keep making it crazier and crazier and more fun and interesting ways. You know, it's this classic premise of what if that SNL sketch where the bears ran the world was true and what would that mean? So I feel like they really did a uh, fun job of playing this out. Also, the River Dicks joke in here is ridiculous and hilarious there it's just a, a, a ton of fun i really appreciate all the absurdity and all the over the topness that goes on in this book i keep being pleasantly surprised by how much fun this book is and i'm glad that you put it in the stack because it is a fucking blast um i also liked it for a very similar reasons um i wanted to shout out the this is no longer earth it's birth and it's a, <laughs> a or birth i guess is i don't know it's hard to say um, and also the uh, human translating bear language as the bear talks in the beginning was very fun a lot of great jokes yeah um and very few shirts Wonder Woman 794 from DC Comics, written by Becky Cluden and Michael W. Conrad, as well as Jordi Belair, art by and Manuelna Lupacino and Polina Ganeshow. In this issue, we're finally finding out the secret of the ooze, or rather the milk, and what mm. has been going on with that in the background as Wonder Woman, Cheetah, and her their friends all team up to try to take down a conspiracy that seemingly is run by Hera. Big action issue. How'd you guys feel about this one? Yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead. I like it uh, a lot. Like, I think we've talked about Wonder Woman a lot, how the expanding mythology and the cast of characters really has made Wonder Woman uh, really fun. And it almost feels like the cast is a little bit more important in the last couple arcs than Wonder Woman uh, herself. Feels like the story sort of rotate around her as opposed to being her we're riding along with. Um, and we see Eros here and... It had me thinking about the um, interesting uh, potential love triangle that is, uh, has been sort of simmering in the background and if we're going to ever see that play out. Yeah, I've been super impressed with this uh, Wonder Woman. This, this really is such a, a well done comic. Uh, I love the art. It's really impressive. I love the story and the, there's some really great fights in this. Um, plus, so you get a little Steve, a little Steve uh, romance yeah. action going on here, a little sprinkling of that. So I appreciate where it's going and what's happening. Uh, it's also impressive the kind of twists and turns that they're putting Wonder Woman through in this. Uh, I feel like they've been doing a great job in this main title. You want to see the rom-com beat, Pete? Oh, I'd love to see it. Love it. Hell to Pay, number two from Image Comics, written by Charles Soule, art by Will Siney. There are two mercenaries who were given a second chance on life by a demonic or angelic, or we're not quite sure, council who is looking to get 666 gold coins that can summon demons back in their possession. There's a big twist in the last issue where it turns out there are more coins out there than they thought. Mm. In this issue, we're dealing with the ramifications of that, as well as expanding the overall mythology. I think we all enjoyed the first issue, but how are we feeling about the second? Well, I, f I really want it to be 333 coins, so that, that way it's 999. You turn up upside down and it's still 666. But, uh, mm. yeah, I, I've been yeah. really uh, pleasantly surprised with this. I love the kind of uh, demon talking about um, how uh, uh, fucked up the stock market is. And uh, I thought that was really fun commentary and very creative. Uh, yeah, I just was uh, kind of impressed with this as, uh, as a whole uh, fantastic art. This is a great package. It's interesting to me there because there's another book out on the stands right now um, about summoning demons uh, through coins, right? Um, that we've talked about the Some Cy Spurrier. Silver coin? Oh. Nope. No, it's the Cy Spurrier book that we've reviewed. Yeah, a couple times. it's not all about all. I'll look up what it is. Keep talking. Um, it's not all about that, but it's just funny that like you get sort of like uh, this cyclically different, similar ideas happening at the same time. But they're very different books, um, and I like both of them. This one, centering on a couple, like, I hope we get to uh, see them work their way through all of this uh, stuff. It's, this one's a little more 
action oriented it feels like mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and uh and the story of the coins feels a little especially with the end of this uh issue it feels like this is a much more complex uh sort of mythology that we need to unravel the other book is damn them all from boom studios yes. oh, right. very fun as well they can both right. exist and they're both good yeah they both cool. exist Number two from Marvel, written by Alyssa Wong, art by Martin Coquello. This is following Deadpool being tasked with killing Dr. Octopus while he has been infestive with a Carnage symbiote at the same time. In this issue, we find out that Lady Deathstrike has teamed up with him, even though she did not appear in the first issue in classic Deadpool fashion. I had a fun time reading this. I think this is enjoyable. Uh, This goofy and... uh, uh, good uh, Deadpool adventures. That's all I got to say. Yeah, I mean, it's like you take Deadpool and you just mat- put a couple other ideas into the uh, bar shaker, shake it up, and you got symbiote, Deadpool, Lady Deathstrike, Doc Ock. Let's go. Yeah, I, it's it's a fun team up for sure. It's a fun Deadpool book for sure. Uh, also gets a little gross with all the arms coming out of him, uh, which was a little a uh, little much, but also over the top, just like Deadpool. And I also thought it was kind of funny that whole Lady Deathstrike conversation. Like, what the fuck, you know? Uh, so yeah, uh, fun Deadpool book. Dark Ride, number three from Image Comics, written by Joshua Williamson, art by Andre Bresson. This is following a demonic theme park that is, of course, infested by demons. We have had a couple of different characters set up over the past couple of issues, including the owner of the park. Something's going on with him. His two kids who are jockeying for control of the park, as well as various other people who have other missions that involve the park, including one character who is looking for her brother, who was killed in the first issue. There's more twists here. There's more darkness. I continue to really, really dig this book. It's horrific. It's interesting. The character stuff is great. Um, just a just a good dark ride. The same team that brought us Birthright, one of my favorite comics um, from the last uh, I don't know ten years, um, bringing that same energy to some, <coughs> excuse me to something that feels a little bit uh, different. It felt like focusing on a location rather than sort of a premise based story felt a little bit more loose at the start. And it's really starting to focus in on what's happening, but leaving a lot of options uh, to go into any horrifying direction that they want to. Like there's a roller coaster that's scary. P, I know that's something that scares you. Nope. Uh, I love roller coasters, but I, I do think this is like too scary for me. I thought mm-hmm. it's it's creepy in all the right ways, but it's, it's so much that... Uh, uh, I don't enjoy reading it. It's so scary, which I think would be perfect for people who enjoy horror. Horror? I don't know why I had a hard time saying that. But yeah, uh, I think this is really just kind of plays on the whole kind of uh, theme park uh, kind of uh, experience and making fun of Disney and all that kind of stuff and all the twisted ways. So yeah, impressive and scary as fuck. You love roller coasters, but this comic was too much of a thrill ride for you. Ooh, well done, sir. Well done. <laughs> Planet Hulk World Breaker, number two from Marvel, written by Greg Pak, art by Manuel Garcia. A thousand years from now on Sakaar, Amadeus Cho is trying to track down Bruce Banner in order to help a bunch of people that have been wrecked and imprisoned by the ruling class. We get some big twists here involving other members of the Hulk family. Pete, I know you've been loving this. Take it away. Oh my God. So this issue is great. It really kind of gets things rolling in such a great way in the second issue. Uh, so excited to see what happens moving forward. Uh, Greg Pak and, uh, is just such a talent. I'm excited to see the She-Hulk kind of factor moving forward. This uh, was a kind of interesting premise that had to kind of be set up a little bit. I feel like in the first issue and on the second issue really hits its stride and is kind of just uh, cooking on all cylinders, super tight bananas art. I was really excited and impressed by this. Can't wait for more. Yeah. You know, last issue I made a comparison between this and old man Logan. You sure did. And I got to say, I feel like that comparison only got stronger and more correct in the second issue. It felt like in this, uh, the, the, 
the story may be going toward Bruce Banner uh, when Will Wolverine didn't want to pop his claws and then did. This is about Bruce Banner not wanting to turn into Hulk and then doing it. Um, we got to see him do that and then walk into, into lava. The, right, because that's his sauna, bro. Like, he is such a badass. He's like, oh, yeah, I get into fucking lava like it's a hot tub. Peace out. It's a great way to make an exit because not many people can follow you. You can't follow him. Walk. Yeah, what are you going to do? But, but I'm curious how that works because Hulk takes damage to his skin. And, you know, he right, gets stronger, sure. he gets angry. But, like, if it's a sauna, isn't he going to get more relaxed and less angry? And oh, eventually the lava is oh, going to kill him? Oh, can you be relaxed and stay angry? I so know what I I'm, can. You can, which is a strange uh, uh, something to brag about for you to say. But I, I'm saying I, my prediction is that's we just saw the Hulk die because that doesn't make any sense. Wow. <laughs> wow. Last issue. Here's another issue of a comic book. Love Everlasting, number five from Image Comics, written by Tom King, art by Elsa Charret here. In this issue, we're getting some big answers kind of about what has been going on with our heroine as she is jumping through various timelines in romance comics. She is psychoanalyzed, this issue, by somebody who is working for her mother, who has also hired the cowboy oh, to kill her. It seems like the clear implication here is that she she does not want to fall in love, does not want to get married. Her mother does want her to do that. And so that's why she's going through all this. My early uh, theory is this is all a simulation that she's being forced through. But mm, over to you uh, guys. Alex, first off, I don't like your accusations there, putting that on her like it's her fault. She doesn't want to fall in love. That's not, it's just, that's not the guy. It's not the, the, the connection that she wants. You know, she can say no to whoever she wants if she's not feeling it. No, and no, no. This... I, I feel like I'm not clear. I am on the mother's side reading this book. She is in yeah. the right. She should be trapping her daughter in a time loop and having a cowboy kill her whenever he, she doesn't marry somebody. Yeah, mommy. It's, mommy is right. I mommy, love mommy. Mommy right. I love, I love yeah. my mommy. Yeah, this is kind of a sad story here of uh, someone who's kind of trapped in a uh, say yes to love or die situation. So uh, it's kind of a sad premise, but it's an interesting premise. And I'm excited to hopefully have her break this horrible loop that her mother is torturing her with. Uh, so maybe she can have her own uh, love story at the end. What I like uh, that Tom King is doing here is sort of, um, it's a story about, yes? What, what, no, why I are you looking at me like It that? was what interesting that, was that Pete was like, I really hope she can hope the cycle of saying no to love and then finally fall in love. Well, she can have it on her own terms and not have somebody else try to fucking make her do anything she doesn't want to do. Maybe you know she mean? doesn't need love. Maybe she well, doesn't yeah, need a relationship I, at all. I'm just, whatever she wants to do, I, I guess. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, She's I'm a young woman in her 20s living in the city but on her own. Just let her live. Can she have uh, career and love at the same time? Seems impossible, but maybe she'll make it work. Uh, That's right. Great art. There's great art in the store. Nice. Um, the, uh, Tom King, I feel like, is, uh, you know, really meta, in a meta way, having this character in a romance comic really push against the borders and have given is given the power to not fall in love and is punished each time and then reset to a different um, sort of type of love story which is a very cool commentary on romance comics in general but also relationships like when it when you are in a relationship with someone and it doesn't work out it does feel like that part of you dies or that connection dies and you have to start over and that oh. is maybe also what is being said here. So wow. lots going on. Well, under the guys. To, uh... You know, you got to think wow. about it. Huh. You know what it's like. <laughs> Dark Web X-Men number one from Marvel, written by Jerry Dugan, art by Rod Rice. This is, as you can probably tell, another issue set in the Dark Web thing, this time focusing on the X-Men and catching up with them. Like you were saying earlier, Justin, there's some goofy shit that goes down here. Oh, this issue especially is wild. Oh, my gosh. And I, between these two issues, I am on board with this. It is like Inferno, which I said before, I think on last week's podcast is one of my favorite crossovers of all time. Yes. Stop repeating yourself. This is this is like the Gremlins to to Inferno. Oh, Gremlins. great call. Wow. Great call. Wow. Wow. It's great. I'm having a I'm having a blast reading these books. Very fun. 
Um, I love that we get Spidey, Firestar, Iceman, some subtle nods to some, at this point, ancient animation. We get NP, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but in um, New York City, which is um, a city that a lot of people <laughs> oh, live you, in. Man. Where, fuck you, man. Fuck you. No, it's a cool city that you should visit at some point. Oh, my God. But there's a, a giant Christmas tree. There's a giant Christmas tree at the center uh, at a place called Rockefeller Center. Oh, my God, um, That they light yeah, ceremoniously. Just work, work right in there. Really? No, because no, yeah. no one who worked in New York City would ever like. Mistake Sorry, when Pete the says he works there, he order. says when he was visiting, he went to ice skating at uh, Rockefeller. No, nope, nope. I worked yeah. at the TGI Fridays in Rockefeller Center. Don't ever go there. <laughs> really? What do you give us? One insight, one behind the scenes insight about what is um, a reason to not go to that TGI. Fridays. People put stuff in the food because there's no repeat customers. It's all tourists. It's all new people every time. Like so what kind they, of stuff? Like salt and pepper and stuff like that? Like flavors. Worse than that. Flavorings. Worse than that. Yeah, flavorings. Yeah. Worse definitely. than salt and pepper? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can't even imagine. Like uh, oregano? Are you talking about oregano? <laughs> no, oh! uh, no flavor anyways, for me, please. The dark web here. Uh, I really uh, thought this was impressive art-wise. And it finally seems like, uh, you know, Marvel is listening to me because Cyclops is dead. Yeah! Come on! Who's excited? No, no what do you mean? Last panel, he's, uh, he's laying there on the, on the floor. No, he's laying. He's, he's, he's dead. He's totally no. dead. Always laying up. That's what superheroes do. A villain stands there on, like, some craggy rock, and then the heroes just all kind of lay down in a very posed manner. No, Happens all the time. Cyclops is dead. He's never getting up. It's the greatest day ever. Mm. Wow. Well, anyway, this is very fun. Let's move to our last book, Ice Cream Man, number 33, from Image Comics, written by W. Maxwell Prince, art by Martin Morazzo. Again, we talked to them about this a bit on our live show. But in this issue, it is split between two stories where they try to wrestle between the type of story they would like to write and the type of story they actually write and how they ultimately intersect. This is in a series of meta stories, maybe the most meta story they've done, but as usual, another good issue of Ice Cream Man. And we talked about this a little bit um, on the live show. I loved having them on there. I love this book. Um, this uh, feels very personal. It feels like this is actual commentary from uh, a writer, if not um, W. Maxwell Prince himself. Um, the story that he wants, that he wishes he could write, um, it's all bright, sort of heroic, but ultimately sort of boring, I would argue, uh, where all the characters are happy and then something good happens. And the, the story that um, he always ends up writing is dark, brooding, but the characters are more uh, truthful in different situations. Um, and they are allowed to fail, which is something that I think we as humans actually do. So it's more true to our experience, which I think is um, just a very cool, like wrestling with light and darkness, but sort of realizing and based on the rest of the stories in this series, which are very dark, feels like there's a truth in darkness that this book and this um, uh, the writer and artist can't help but uh, continue to tell. All right. Well, I, I feel like the you know, how many amazing things can we say about this comic? Let's try for more. Uh, every time I pick up an Ice Cream Man comic, I'm like, I, I get nervous. I get excited. I don't know what I'm going to get. It's such a interesting, cool feeling that I don't have with a lot of comics. Um, you know, they are so creative and working on pushing things in such different ways. It's very impressive that they're able to do it for so long and you still don't know what you're going to get with the comic. It's so impressive what they're accomplishing. This is an amazing duo. We could have talked to them for hours about their process. It, it turns out the artist cream. creepily looks in the mirror and just kind of draws himself, which scares the fuck out of me. Also, the fact that he reveals that he also holds his knives to his children's just to uh, kind of capture the emotion. Like, should these people be allowed to have kids or be alone out in the world? I don't know. But this book is really impressive in such a interesting way. Like, the difference between shading and storytelling and what the author wants to put on the page versus what comes out is such a cool take and such a fun look behind the kind of creative curtain. I was so impressed with that. And it also talks about 
how much you can portray with art and with shading, like showing the same panels, but doing different shades and kind of highlighting different areas. It's just such a cool how to make comics at the same time. Uh, yeah, just if you're not reading Ice Cream Man, what the fuck are you doing, man? Do you even like comics? Like, pick this the wow. fuck up. Wow. Great place to end up here. If you'd like to support our podcast, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to Crowdcast and YouTube. Sure do. Come hang out. We'd love to chat with you about comic books, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow the show at Comic Book Live on Twitter, comicbookclublive.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, we'll see you at the comic book shop. The moral of this episode, like um, Pete always says, is always puff the fluff, but never hump the hound dogs. Good night. <laughs>